paper is what happens with water when you nano-confine water, okay? But before talking about this, we are going to cover a few very basic things, so everybody is going to be very happy because we are going to listen to something that you already know, that you will be needed either to connect with what Henrique is going to talk about, that about scattering, so I'm going to talk things that connect with scattering, and water, and, and with the things that Paola is going to talk also, that's what happens with water, immerse in other species. Okay. So our purpose in these three lectures that I'm giving is to cover phase transitions, very basic, undergrad type of uh, things, but I, with that I make sure we are in the same page, uh, and water anomalies, that the things I'm going to do today, and try to bind these two things in one concept. Then, uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about nano-confined water, when water is confined in solid materials, like carbon nanotubes, anything that's solid, and then nano-confined water in non-solid things, that biology. Biology will be doing like that, so First we confine like that, then you confine in something that is moving and trying to understand the distinction. So this is, uh, this is real, no, it's not a cartoon, it's a real picture of an iceberg in the region of Patagonia. And we can see here that we have liquid water, solid water, and if you have very good eyes, you can see some water vapor. And underneath here is there is a, this is, is, this is a cartoon of a part of the phase diagram, pressure versus temperature of phase diagram of water, in which you have vapor, liquid water, supercritical water. Here is a whole bunch of solid phases in, in, in water. Okay? And we are going to discuss, when we discuss the anomalies of water, basically in this region here, very cold, uh, water. But let's start with basic stuff. Let's start talking about phase transitions when you have something that changes from one state to another. And here again, I'm trying, I'm bringing the pressure versus temperature phase diagram of water. And you know that in a certain region, temperature and pressure are going to have vapor, in another one you have liquid, and then you have, if you make very cold, you end up uh, in a region in which you have many solid, possible solid phases. And they, we have a handout today that uh, Henrique is going to give you something to do, but my homework is that's very simple, it's absolutely simple. You have to tell me if there is any rule regarding the angles of this region where you have a triple point, and I might start by saying that this graph is wrong, okay? This graph, this triple point have something that is wrong about the angles that each phase occupies in the phase diagram, okay? So look, if there is any specific angle that a phase cannot occupy in a triple point area? That's the question. And then you have plenty of time to go to the internet and try to find if there is a solution for that. If you don't find in the next lecture, I give you the paper that answer to this question. But one thing that this graph shows is that along this line in which you have the gas liquid coexistence, here they have the gas solid coexistence, and here they have, it's really a cartoon because it's doing curves, unbelievable curves uh, uh, in the scenario. So we have the phases, and the phases can be something as simple as this cartoon of solid, liquid, and vapor, but also can, see, can be magnetic stuff. We can ha have a phase in which the spins of the magnets are all mixed up, and a phase in which they are pointed out 
in the same direction. These are, again, two phases, very different from the fluid phases, but they are phases, are two things that you look, you measure a property like the magnetization, and you have a different answer from one uh, picture to the other. But then there are other very fascinating uh, materials, like this mixture, this, this compound of zinc and copper, in which as you change, and you see in this up picture here, that you have the, the copper in the middle. But as you change the temperature, they start to swap positions, okay? So they keep swapping. First they are fixed. I'm here, I'm happy here, nothing is going to move me from here, and you have this configuration up here. But then you start to heat the material, and they use swap positions. And by swapping the positions means that at the higher temperature, if you point in a specific space, if you point here in the space, you know that you have zinc. You know, because it's in the space that you know. But if you are in, in another uh, temperature, this position will have a copper. So you see here, before you have the, the, the zinc, but now you have a copper because they are swapping positions. So here the order parameter, or the way you measure the phases, is the probability of finding a specific zinc or copper. And this change from this configuration in which everything is fixed to this configuration in which they are swapping makes that the original crystal structure changes. Because one crystal structure is cubic with this being one specific spot, and the other one is cubic center. Because now I have something that's not even blue or gray, it's a mixture of probability of being blue or gray. And the transition from one to the another is again a phase transition. I'm changing something that I measure, but the phenomena have nothing to do with the magnets doing this or being disorganized, or the density that means that the particles are connected very fixed space as solid or more wumbling around as liquid or very crazy as the gas. is another type of phase transition. So phases and phases transition can really be varied. This is one material that I love, and the reason why I love is that I did my master and my PhD on this material, that strontium titanate. At the time I did the master and the PhD, this was not a fashionable material. Then with the high TC, superconductor became a uh, fashionable material. But this material that you see that it has this very complex uh, structure, but you see in the center you have the titanium, and then you have this, uh, this oxygens that have this pinkish format, and then you have the silica around. And as you heat the material, the oxygens, they start to move. And you can see that that's easy because they are very symmetric. They start to bounce like in a dancing in this middle. And this makes that the structure, as you bounce this oxygen, that they are, when they are moving, against the fundamental crystal change from one format to another format, okay? The fascinating thing about this material is that usually when you work with solid materials, the transitions from one structure to another structure, it's a first order type, it means that it's very abrupt, boom, change this. But because this is a dance of these oxygens doing that, this becomes a continuous type of transition, and this material is very, interesting about that, and if you want to play games and put pressure, for instance, in the diagonal, you actually change the structures that you end up doing because it's like you are pressing some of the oxygens while they are dancing, doing this, this, this movement, the circular movements. 
So again, this is a very fascinating material, as many materials, that changes the structure by the temperature change. Here just to show some of the, just designing the oxygens, how the, the, these things uh, are changing. And this is, I didn't put, but this is the pressure. As you change pressure, you kind of dense, the, you change this rotation that was more uh, in one way, you change to another way, what makes uh, certain properties to vary a lot. So it's not just a beautiful change of structure, it means that material can become ferroelectric, have a different types of properties that are very uh, fundamental. Then also you have the liquid crystals that are kind of uh, bipolar type of molecule because they are not liquid, they are not crystal, they are something in between. And that Again, when you make changes in temperatures and sometimes in pressures, you can have something very disorganized or something organized in one direction, organized in another direction to something very organized. You can have very interesting transitions between all those phases. And also polymers, okay? Polymers are incredible because if you Mix two types of polymers. We are mixing a red one, it's a blue one, and you make games with that. Say, for instance, uh, the blue love blue but hates red, but they are connected because they are polymers. I can pick two of them, radiate, and say, you hate each other, but they're going to live forever, like marriage or like your advisor, and you connect. And, and then, Depending on the temperature, pressure, or the composition, or sizes, you can make different types of phases in which they try to split, they don't have enough to split, or they do have enough to split, and you generate all types of possible phases. You see like here you have more red, more red, more red, more green, more green, but they want to a divorce, but they, they are connected. Okay. And, and they form these unbelievable materials when I do that because I can combine materials that are very rigid with materials that are very flexible. And with that, I get something that have resistance and flexibility. And if you are not, you think that this, this is useless, I might say that probably your shoes are made of some of these types because this is the, things, the type of material you use to to generate all things that we are using in, the, in our shoes. Then also something more sophisticated, like helium, in which you have two different type of phases in which one of the phases is a superfluid phase. Okay? That does exactly what I say, come from one region to the other region. And also, if now you take some lasers, and you have uh, atoms, real atoms, you can control with lasers and temperature. If there's atoms, you build lasers here are represented by this box that looks like an egg box. And they are trapping these particles, but then if you heat or put some interactions, you can put them together. Okay, so you can play games with that, you can play games with fermions that want to be apart or bosons that want to be together. You can make all kinds of games and with that you get different phases. If the different phases you want to understand which one of those phases. Understanding the phases means that now you're going to put this in some sort of phase diagram in which you play with pressure and temperature, uh, magnetic field and temperature, or composition and temp you you choose some things that you are tuning in your lab and you decide in this phase diagram by measuring which phase is living where and in which conditions two phase one to be together it means that the two phases have the, the same probability of being present because they have the same energy and that's the phase diagram and here again, I'm showing a cartoon of uh, two different materials, water and CO2, in which I'm illustrating 
uh, a phase diagram for those two materials in which I have the vapor, the liquid, solid, that in the case of water are many solid phases, vapor, liquid, and solid phases. And where those lines, the solid lines, represent uh, first order transitions means that in these lines I have liquid and vapor coexistence. In this slide I have vapor and solid coexistence, and in this line we have solid and liquid coexistence. And the slope of this line is very important, is very exaggerated, this is a cartoon, uh, because this slope is related with the anomalies of water. And here you have vapor, and you see the slope is different. Actually, the slope here is wrong. It could not be for the homework I gave you. You have to tell me why. And again, coexistence. In this particular case, in the liquid and vapor, this coexistence end in a critical point, like here, in a critical point. So there is something that is a transition, something that's coexisting and end up in this very particular point that will be very important when you describe different properties of water. Another phase diagram, this is very boring because I didn't put here, but his, here is, is, is temperature. So I have uh, a magnetic field that splits if I have spin up or down, and in this part, that's the paramagnetic part, I have the disorder. So coming back to the phases, what I have here, it's order up or down in the magnetic field you describe is up or down, and at high temperatures I have the, the random stuff. The, the interesting thing is that here, even if without any magnetic field, I can have spins up or down for temperatures below this critical temperature. And here I have the, old, the critical point I just mentioned for the liquid water. So I have a total different phenomena that also appears to have this critical point. A very important point, and this is a coexistence. This, my favorite uh, is strontium titanate, and you can see because this is a much more complex than uh, the magnetic system I just described. I, I'm putting the temperature in here, pressure, and that also means the fraction of the oxygen. And you can see that the variety of potential phases I have here, it's, it's enormous. So it's a much more complex phase diagram that you just temperature and pressure is not enough for the description, because here I have actually a critical line, a whole line of critical points. To, and if you look, saw that I have a, a, a continue, uh, uh, first order transition that ends in a critical point, to split this, I would need another, another axis here coming, and then you can have uh, a tricritical point. But we are going to discuss a little bit later. Then you have the whole variety of uh, liquid cold crystal, like isotropic, nematic, ismetic, and solid. So all these phases I showed before, they are separated, again, by lines in which they have a phase transition between one phase to another. And the question we always address is which, which type of phase transition you have here. And then the polymers that have all these fantastic distributions, again, I have a disorder phase in which they are not forming anything, and you have this different uh, phases here. Because our polymers, what I'm playing here, is with the fraction of which one of the species. Here's the fraction with A, and here I have the, the co different compositions I have. The helium, again, I have the two types of helium, and then I have a vapor phase, and this is a critical line between this this, uh, these two phases that I appear in the helium. And then I have the cold atoms in which I have isolator, quantum critical region, and a superfluid in which I'm controlling here to the lasers, the interactions between the different atoms, and here I have the temperature. So I have when I have different systems, I have different properties that define the phases, but somehow the phase diagram seems to 
have some sort of things in common. Either I have one phase, or I have two coexistence, or I end up in a very mysterious type of things that's critical. Even if they are different materials, even if the, the, the properties, the axes I'm calling from different names, usually uh, nature says, I have this, I have that, I have both, and I end up in a very blurred situation that's the critical lines, the critical points. Okay? This is more or less the variety of options we have when we design the phases. So let's start with the simple fluid type of phases, but now I'm designing in a different type the phase diagram. I'm putting temperature and I'm putting density. And because I'm writing density, I already know that I'm talking about a fluid, because density will be the specific property that we look when we look solid, liquid, and gas. Okay? And in this uh, type of phase diagram, you see that I have at high temperatures above this point, that's the critical point, a fluid that might coexist. When I have in density, this means that this whole area, the whole area is a coexistence type of area, that the fluid might coexist with solid, crystalline structure is here. Then I have an area in which I have vapor. This whole area is a coexistence, coexisting with liquid. And a critical point to be here, in which I have vapor, I have liquid, and I have crystal. Okay, so it's my triple point is here, my critical point is here, and this is, means that I have a coexistent area. And because I have this type of phase diagram, I know I'm treating like a very simple fluid because I just have the three phases, and I have coexistence between liquid and vapor that ends up in a critical point. If I go back to this phase diagram, it's like... In this line, you have this big area of coexistence. It's illustrated here. It's just one line. That point is the critical point. The triple point is that slash line I show you. Then they have this whole area of coexistence solid and coexistence vapor. Because solids go forever, also you have a down here fluid and solid coexistence. OK? If I look at the same graph, now I'm going just to look to the top of the graph, this top of the graph, this part here. So what I see is that as I come from different temperatures, here I'm coming from the, the liquid phase, I reach in a certain pressure in which I have a transition from this liquid to the gas phase. And I do so until the critical point. What I want to, to observe here is that I go, if I go up to critical point, what happens is the density of liquid that's here and the density of gas, they come to be very close to this critical temperature in which you cannot say what's the difference between one density and another. What means that when I approach the critical point, the very very thing that I define it as a thing that makes liquid and vapor different, that's the density, becomes equal. Okay? So when I walk in the solid line, I go up in the solid line, the difference between solid and liquid goes to zero. They become the same thing. Okay? And that will be the case for any other parameters we call other parameters, the property that we're selecting to define the phases near critical point. OK? So here again, my design of the, the three phases, uh, liquid, solid, and gas. Okay. And here, just to show that this point will be this, this point will be this, this whole line is all this region is like this whole region in this, this, this line. And the same will be for all these areas in which I have any type of coexistence. Now, let's talk about this 
first about these, li these lines here, okay? What you call first order phase transition. Because we call first order because I have a jump in the density. The density on one side is one value, the density on the other side is another value, means that the density have a jump in value. So this uh, first order transition, you also have a jump in the entropy. And the Gibbs free energy in this region is so that it's continuous, because it's still continuous. It's have this shape, because thermodynamics implies that when you have the Gibbs free energy in temperature, you have to be this shape. But as you see, the slope of this side, the slope of these sides are different. What means that the derivative of the, 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 the G with respect to T, that's the entropy, have a job that I'm representing here. But also if I design the same graph, G against P pressure, it will be similarly this shape with I slope that's discontinuous, and that's why the derivative of the G dt, that is the volume, you also have a jump. This means that is discontinuous in the very property, volume, whatever, uh, that you're using, and you'll be discontinuous in the, in the entropy as well. And this is just to show some of the examples of uh, Gs for other materials than what I was discussing first, that the, uh, the liquid gas. So we have many transitions that are first orders. You're going to have one slope, change of slope, for each one of the first order transitions you appear, if you are able to calculate the Gibbs free energy for temperature. And that's what happens with the specific heat, that's the second derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respects to T, also can appear with a jump. So if we agree with, in the first order phase transition, we have a discontinuous derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to intensive parameters. I call intensive parameters because uh, I don't want to be a specific that have to be uh, pressure or temperature because we might use something different, okay? And not, we have a non-zero latent heat that's derived from jump in entropy. And that this continues usually heat capacity in constant pressure. But then, let's approach this point, okay? And this point, the critical point. And if approach this critical point, just sorry I didn't mention the temperatures, but I was uh, increasing the temperature at the constant, at constant pressure. In, in this material that's a mixture of cyclohexano anilina for a very, very old experiment, what happens is that you only get uh, close to this, you have the two phases, and you have a moment in which your whole tube become blurred. The photo is not very good. You can see the original in Stanley's book. But the whole tube becomes very blood. Then you change a little bit the temperature, the blood goes away. In that particular point in which things get blurred is the critical point. Blurred means that you have huge correlations inside your tube, and it's something that the Henrique is going to show to you to the scattering, but in this particular experiment is, is the blurriness. When it Come to that region also here, I'm, I'm plotting in a different way, I'm plotting density here against temperature. You're going to see that you are approaching for uh, different uh, pressures, uh, reaching to the critical point of pressure in which you see this slope very, it's not a discontinuous, it's a very steep slope that also uh, happens at the critical point. And when you look to the specific heat uh, at constant pressure and you approach to the critical point, you see a divergence. So at the critical point, 
you see that the density that comes from high temperatures, very smooth, becomes steep. Things get blurred. And you start to have second derivatives of the, the Gibbs free energy becoming divergent. So we are going, this is all connected with the fact that uh, we are going to have a particular behavior for scattering functions, that's the blurness, that becomes also a behavior for, for the, the second derivatives of the, the free energy. Here I'm putting in the specific, the specific heat, but you can have compressibility, and you can have also the uh, susceptibility in the magnetic case, and you can have other. So in the particular case of the critical phenomena, you have a smooth Gibbs free energy, no kinks, no jumps in the first derivative. You have a very steep, but not discontinuous, entropy. That's the first derivative. But you have a divergence in the specific heat. Okay, so it's something that appears only in the second derivative. It's a subtle, it's just one point, and it's related to correlations. Now, comparing my Gibbs free energy in the first order transition, I have a, a discontinuous slope, continuous slope, a jump in the first derivative, no jump, um, maybe a discontinuity in the second derivative for the first order transition, and certainly a divergence and in the second order phase transition. And because in this point, things seems to have a very particular behavior, people in the past did the following. It start to calculate the density of different materials close to the critical point, making the density divided by the critical density and the temperature divided by the critical temperature. And you have this peculiar type of data collapse. When I have data collapse, means that there is something, some behavior that is the same for this different distinct materials, okay? If you get, because something is common, maybe I can do a theory and calculations that put all then in the same basket. And the thing uh, with time people discover is that if I write all those uh, functions like the specific heat, the density, the difference in density, and the compressibility as a function of t minus tc over tc that I'm calling epsilon, I can express them with particular exponents that are the same for all those materials. Actually, that are the same for a whole bunch of materials. Okay, there is something in common in this critical phenomena because of this correlation. Okay? And that I can express, like here, this in terms of a specific heat exponent, I can express the compressibility, and that those critical exponents are not independent, they are dependent by a quantity. So if I know two, I know three. Okay, and there are many other critical exponents that also have these funny relations. Well, the scattering, in, it will be three lectures <laughs> with Henrique. I'm not discussing. Now I'm going to change a little bit gears to see how all this very basic uh, ideas of first order transition, phases, critical phenomena, and phase transition have anything to do with water. So again, with this beautiful picture. Actually, uh, it, this, this friend of mine that makes these pictures once did one picture that I lent to Stanley, and I discovered recently in a cover uh, of, uh, then I have to explain to my friend, well, I passed the picture, and he's using this picture. Well, so water. Water has a very peculiar behavior for a number of properties, and here I'm plotting the, wow, it's very small, but uh, is the heat capacity of water in terms of temperature. So what is peculiar here is both that have this U shape, as I decrease the temperature, it seems, 
If you are very optimistic, you think that it's, this might diverge, and there is a whole class of people in the planet that are optimistic and think that this, if I go, I cool down enough without making water becomes ice, uh, this might diverge, actually diverge, but then you have a little problem that uh, water in you cool down tends to become ice, so we have to avoid the ice to do that, and in simulations we can do that because in simulations you might be God, so you decide it's not freezing and you make not freeze with the right model. But this, the, so this is peculiar, this is not common for the other materials, but also water have a very high heat capacity, what is very good for us means that we do not oscillate too much our temperature uh, being full of water, and the ocean don't oscillate too much the temperature. But if you keep it messy, mis mixing stuff in the ocean, you might change this as well. So those are two properties that are very interesting, but people got very fascinated with the fact that it grows a lot as you decrease the temperature. Just to illustrate that this is peculiar to water, if you do the same specific heat for methanol, you see that there's no way back here. It's just increased with temperature, like in this area in which water is very normal type of liquid. And you see that the specific heat of water is almost double of the methanol. Uh, and you know that, because water, when you go to the beach, have a very little fluctuation in the temperature. Then you have the compressibility, that's the response uh, on the volume for pressure change. And again, you come with this U behavior. Again, compressibility is a second derivative. And seeing a second derivative increasing might make us dream that is diverging, what means that we might have a critical phenomenon close by. This is a concept that will come when both Paola and later I bring with confined water, this concept might emerge again. And here I'm illustrating this with Toluen, in which here are putting different pressures, but Toluen is all this increasing, and here you have this U behavior of compressibility. Uh, maybe the most non-behavior, funny behavior of water is the thermal expansion coefficient that becomes negative. Usually thermal expansion coefficients are boring. They do not change that much with temperature. But for water, it does, and it becomes negative. And if you see the definition, this is basically minus the d rho dt, the variation of density with temperature, what means that the if the variation, the slope of density change signs, means that density have to have this shape. What's not obvious again, because most materials, when you freeze them, they have uh, this behavior. That you freeze them, they increase density, but water has cold region in which it does uh, the contrary. But pay attention that the numbers are amazingly small. It's not a huge. I trick the graph by making a zoom in. It's a very tiny type of change. Okay, and here for different pressures, this this is from one bar. This is from different pressures, the same behavior, and that's why we have the maximum density that's four centigrade salt in the bottom of a river and you have ice in the surface, that you have a density that's even lower than the ones I illustrated, that I just illustrated for liquid water. But let's look to the molecule, so we attempt to understand what are the ingredients that make this crazy increase, uh, if I try to convince with the, my fingers. So this is water, here the oxygen, I don't know why, they love to put it red, and the hydrogens, and the funny thing is that they make it the same size usually. Okay, it's a, it's a type of fake democracy, but anyway, they usually design like that. But when you look the the, the real structure, and the covalent bond of oxygen and hydrogen will be a covalent bond in which the electron of hydrogen will, will be most of the time close 
to the oxygens, what generates the polarization. And this is the fundamental tool for water to be crazy. Because then I create a, a, a dipole in this area. I generate this shape also because I have two electrons float here, and I have these two ones from the shell here, here, and that will be the, the organization of the molecule. What that will be basically this, this will be more negative, this will be more positive, and with that, this dipole, I create the hydrogen bonds with four other water molecules. Hydrogen bonds are present when you have Hydrogen. Hydrogen is a, a molecule that when combined with any other, because only you have one electron, you'll be sharing this electron, and the other electron will be gone to whatever it's linking. But the particular case of water is that you are forming four hydrogen bonds because of the structure of the oxygen. And this is like being a prison. Okay? It's tied to this structure. The hydrogen bond is not a very strong link, it's not a covalent bond, but yet it's forming and just forming all the time when you look to a glass of water. And this gives some type of structure okay, to the system. So when you look to this what you call tetramers, the tetramers might be linked with other tetramers not bonding or bonding. And if you observe for making hydrogen bonds, you need the specific distance and angle because of the way the dipole moments are organized. So you have to have the specific distance, you have to have the specific angle for them to form. If you heat a system, even a little bit, if you give it some entropy, you break the hydrogen bonds and the system got closer. And now you can understand the density anomaly. I'm coming for how temp high temperature. And then I cool down, I don't have, kind of have less energy, and then I form the hydrogen bonds. If by forming the hydrogen bonds, I do that. By doing that, I decrease the density. Okay, so all the time in this liquid water, I have these two type of structures existing and coexisting. They form and this form, but as I cool down, I will form more of this and less of this. As I heat up, this wind. As I cool down, this wind. They are not phases, but you can think that they have some spirit of coexisting structure that might, might become phases at some point. So when I look a lot of water molecules mix. You have to think that even though it's all disorganized, you have bunches of tetramers that are connected. The difficulty is that they connect and disconnect. You know, the hydrogen bonds are very promiscuous. They survive very little time, okay? But they are there. It's like you look, they're here, 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 you look there here, they look there here. We have the hydrogen bonds forming, it's just that they don't last a lot, okay? It's like you when you go to those, you know, the Z, the new Z generation go into parts. Some things, you connect and disconnect. So when you look one of those pictures in a specific spot, you see all connected by hydrogen bonds. But if you, if you see far apart, you don't see a lot of the connections. This means that the local entropy, the entropy of one region, is very low. It's very organized, low entropy. But the connected entropy, the average entropy, is very high. This means the fluctuation of entropy, means the, the local entropy, that's very low, minus the average entropy square, that's this, you be negative square, and you be increasing as you decrease the temperature. Because as you decrease the temperature, the locals will be more and more and more forming hydrogen bonds. And the fluctuation of entropy is another way to, to write the specific heat at the constant pressure. And if you have any doubt of that, see the 
the derivation in the Salinas book. I'm not getting any money from Silvio Salinas for making ads from his book, but his book presents this quite well. And that's why this goes up. Okay, this goes up because you start to have more and more and more of those guys. Okay, when I go to the compressibility, it's the same game. But now compressibility is the fluctuation of the volume. And you see there's local volume is large because it's all bounded. When I disbound it, I make this. So the average volume is smaller. So we have this large minus smaller square. You have this increasing as you form more and more or more of those guys. And this explains without any calculation, it explains why I have this divergence appearing here. And the alpha, the thermal expansion coefficient, is the cross of these two things. Remember, this was negative, this is positive, and this is why this is negative. So the basic idea that water form hydrogen bonds, but more than forming hydrogen bonds, they form types of structures that are bonded or non-bonded, is kind of basic to, to try to understand some of the water anomalies. Water, water have more than 70 anomalies. This is just one principle to try to understand what is going on. This, with time, became uh, a two-state model that Paula Mai mentioned. Okay? That is, I can describe the anomalies by a system that have two states, like two states, like two phases, but they are both co co coexisting all the time, and that somehow, at some point, they will split. We don't see them splitting because it happened, and you know, temperatures in which water will freeze. Okay, so this is the design. This is against all the, ro the, the remaining. It's a correct phase diagram. The only thing that's pictoric here is this design here. Okay, that's a coexistent line ending in a critical point here. If I can erase the solid states, they, voila, water, you cannot become solid. The idea is that you are going to have two liquid phases coexisting that end up in a critical point because the anomalies happen in this region, we are just seeing the specific heat going to diverge when they arrive to this critical point. Nobody ever found in experiments this critical point. So it still is hypothesis based in this increase of those functions. A lot of people try to make experiments to see that, but it's not easy. In simulations, we can construct models in which the models show the existence of these critical points. Okay? But simulations, you put whatever you want. Yeah, okay. So you can avoid crystallization. And this is, you see, this is the pressure temperature, and this is the the this is the temperature density. And you see, because of the anomalies, remember this is was something that should go like this. This is the liquid gas. So the location of this low density liquid, the high density liquid, will be at low temperatures, higher densities. And you're going to see something like that will be the critical point here. This band here is related with the the, some of the anomalies, including the density anomalies, is very exaggerated. But just to show that the hypothesis is that we are going to find these phases. One way people are attempting to find those phases is by confining, because confines make, depending on the way you confine, confining water might make not crystallize. And then you can see, you can observe the low density and high density liquid. I might say in favor of this hypothesis that if you quench very quick, you decrease the temperature very fast, either here or here, you find two amorphous phases. One high density amorphous phase and low density amorphous phases. But this is out of equilibrium uh, type of experiments. And there is no guarantee that they become 
a low density liquid and a high density liquid. So this is again the same phase diagram in which here this do exist that the low density amorphous phase and high density amorphous phase, auto equilibrium, the system becomes super viscous. Then you have the uh, hypothetical critical point with a coexistence between the low density liquid water and high density. I hate this. It's a uh, thing in the past, Can, cannot be called no man's land because this is where. Uh, the system just crystallize, okay? Should be no human land or no person lands, but this is the old plot from from Gene Stanley. Then you have this whole super cool region, means that water is should be crystal, but it's not crystal because you manage to keep it liquid, and Paula is going to talk about this, and then we have stable water. Most of the things I'm going to talk about confined water will be either here or in the supercooled region of water. So next, that will be only on Thursday, we are going to discuss the nano-confined water in uh, graphene, in na carbon nanotubes, in the sulfetomolybdenum type of nanotubes and membranes, and ask what happens with water when you tied then confine it in something. Questions? Too basic? It's not a transition. Super cool is a um, boundary that might change in depending strongly on what you do. It's just to illustrate. You mean here? Yeah. Here. This is, is just an illustration. Because the, when you super cool water, it very much depends on the way you are doing it, in the process you are doing. It just is illustration based in some information of, about uh, simulations and experiments people are doing in this area. Okay? It's not, don't consider that a transition. It's just a, a guide for your eye that you have some boundaries here because the supercooled water will be not very stable. You do that, you do something very slow, keeping it in the system. The, the only experiments that you know, people are doing is that they do auto-equilibrium experiments. Okay? So they, they heat lasers in a little drop of water, and they see that when the heat laser on the this, this thing, you can see two densities. But it's don't live so, enough to be stable, and nobody expects to be stable because it's in this area in which you don't expect stable water. Another thing people are doing is that they go, you see the critical point have this slash line here, okay? Because imagine, if I get to the critical point in the specific heat diverge, when I get close, it will have to have a peak. You understand? No, nothing goes from smooth to divergent. Nature is, the, the Gibbs free energy don't work like that. So people, we know that if there is a divergence here, around here there will be peaks. Okay, and if I see huge peaks crossing there, I can uh, get. So what people is do is they confine water in cages, nano cages. With that, they change the position of this a little bit upper, and they see the peak, but they don't see the critical point. They see the continuation, because here, not even the continuation you can see because it's in this region. So you confine. Confinement usually moves the transition. So they confine to move the transition. And then they cross the dashed line. And they see peaks in the specific heat and the compressibility. 
But then also there's this whole discussion if what you're seeing is due to the move because you confine or is due to the confinement, some property of confinement. You understand my point? There is, if I confine things, I change the things I'm doing. And I, I know that I change by moving things to up because I decrease entropy. You know, at high temperature, I get more entropy. But if I tidy, I decrease the effect of entropy. By decreasing the effect of the entropy, I move my phase diagram all up. But this is only this what I'm doing or confining in changing the physics of the problem. So there is a discussion. And this is experiments in a discussion of the validity of this experiment. And obviously, in the simulations, we can get models that get the second critical point, get whatever. If you design for it, you get it. Okay. And other systems that design water that do not get it. So it still is, is very much under debate. Questions? Maybe. One of you, you discover. And, 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 you know, this, even though it looks like a very simple thing, this topic is always in the biggest list for the Nobel Prize. But you never get, because, uh, if you don't have the final experiment. Who and who? The MIs, the ice, ice solid. No. The the basic structure, but one moves, and another don't moves. The liquid we have a non-zero diffusion constant. That will be the thing we are going to mention in the next. But the diffusion constant is basically. Uh, so you have the density close to the density amorphous case, but the amorphous is not going, you have almost zero diffusion. But as you go up, the expectation is that the low density liquid have diffusion. And in the water model, it has the diffusion. Questions? Yes, the, the, the amount of degrees of freedom that a system has defines if you have what the, the type of phase diagram you can have. Because water is what you call a simple with commas, because of the number of uh, components, you ha just have one density, you just have, you only can have a point in a critical point. The discussion that at the beginning was strange was that it can have two critical points, but it cannot have a critical line. Because of the number. Good questions for the hand on uh, is what number of components a system can need to have in order to have a critical line? Components by the degrees of freedom to represent the system. Okay. Yeah. No. No. You can have, if the system do not have enough degrees of freedom, you only have a critical point. What you can do is to make a trick. Showing that in our axis, let's see a critical line here. I have for helium here. This is a critical line. Okay, this is a first order transition. This is a critical line. 
Suppose I make a cut, because, because this is a critical line, means that I have a second x that I'm not showing here of a, of a uh, intensive order parameter. If I have and I do a cut here, I'm going to see a point. Okay, but, but this system have a line. What this system have a line, what means that uh, including that this point here is very interesting because the point where a critical point meets a first order transition. Okay, because of this, it actually this design is wrong again. It have to bend down a little bit because of that. So it, most of the phase diagrams people design like that, and they have rules that are basic in, in based in, in thermodynamic, uh, based in the second law of thermodynamics. So this questions how many, I, there's a rule of number of phases. You can find this in the demonstration in Kali. That you'll be very close to the demonstration of the how many degrees of phase can you occupy near a critical point, a tri triple point. Okay, but you're not going to find this second answer in Kali. <laughs> No, because it's not the liquid crystal. You, you have a order in one direction. There is one direction of order, and that will not be. It will be a structure, but a structure that can move not in a specific direction. Between liquid and the two liquid. <laughs> No, no, but the liquid crystal is stable. If you leave it alone, you'll be like that. You're saying, well, but if I pick any material and I stress the material, the material you will be, <laughs> I will distort the material in one direction. That is what you call cesalhamento, distress. But the liquid crystal will order in this particular ray that if I allow it to have a dynamic, it's going to flow in a specific way. Next, I bring a video of a simulation we did in a liquid crystal-like structure. You're going to see that it's, it flows in line. You don't push, you don't do anything. It's just diffusing. It will prefer to diffuse in one specific direction. The other direction is like it's a solid. Is it? So, break, lunch break. Almoço e volte para o stand-up, tá, gente? Aí eu posso ajudar. É muito bonita essa demonstração. Eu, pelo menos, gosto. É uma aula de termodinâmica.